Welcome to the YouTube channel for Sunset Canyon Baptist Church. My name is Russell Dixon and I have the privilege of serving as the senior pastor here. You know, the only way we can bring messages like the one you're about to watch, both to our YouTube channel and to our podcast is through the generosity of not only our church family, but also of you, our extended family. So if you would like to contribute to help support the work that God is doing through this ministry financially, you can go to our website at sunsetcanyonchurch.org and simply click on the button that says give. We hope that this week's message encourages you to seek Jesus, and we pray that it helps you to grow in your walk with Him. Now, here's this week's message. Greg, a huge round of applause for all of his hard work on that video. It turned out awesome. I've seen it a thousand times and I laugh every single time. It's so great. I have a really good friend in ministry. His name is Ben Flanagan and he serves as the discipleship pastor at my previous church. And when he was early in ministry, he was probably 19 years old. He was still in Bible college and he had the opportunity to intern for one of his pastor friends. And so he was super excited. It was a small church, and so when he was thrown in the trenches, uh, he was doing anything and everything from teaching youth group Bible studies to mopping the floors. How many of you know that other duties as assigned is how it rolls in ministry? Amen? And so uh, he was serving, and the pastor said, hey, I'm going to have you preach your first message in a couple of weeks. And so his eyes got about this big, He was really excited, and he was working on his message like every waking moment from then till the day that it came. And I think the pastor chose the Sunday night service. This was back in the Sunday night church world. I know you young people don't really know anything about Sunday night church, but those of us that are like my age and up, it was every time the doors opened, we were there, right? So uh, he was preparing for the Sunday night service, and they, they start the worship service, as most services do, where you have your music. And at one point, the worship pastor had everybody sit down, and they had a time where you could come up to the altar to pray. And so Ben and the pastor were sitting there on the front row, and Ben decides to make his way to the altar, and people are seated like this, and he goes up and prays, and he's obviously really nervous, and he goes back to sit down, and the pastor had noticed something about his demeanor, we'll say, when he went up to the altar that he thought was kind of interesting to say the least. And so he goes back and sits down and the pastor was like, I've got to say something to him at some point because his demeanor is definitely off here. But he didn't know, should I say it now or should I just let him get through the message and tell him later? And so finally the worship pastor had everybody stand back up. And so the pastor thought this is a good time. And so the pastor took his arm, put it around Ben and he said, Ben, so proud of you, buddy. You're going to do a great job tonight preaching. One piece of advice make sure you always wear a belt because you just told the whole congregation there's a full moon tonight. Imagine the difficulty of having that conversation, right? Work relationships often involve difficult conversations, don't they? And I know that for all of us here today, we may not all still be working in a vocational job, but we all have some sort of a calling on our life, amen? And so today, as we continue this series called Next Level, where we're looking at the relationships in our lives, I want to talk to us today about our work relationships, because our work relationships are a significant portion of our lives. As a matter of fact, studies show that the average American spends 30 to 40 percent of their entire life at work. Now, that's important because we interact with other people. And a matter of fact, the word in Hebrew that's used throughout the Old Testament for work is this word avodah. Y'all say that with me. One, two, three, avodah. So avodah means work 
It means service, or watch this, it also means worship. That is really important because I think many of us, myself included, think of worship as the 20 minutes that happens on a Sunday morning before the message. And we are called as Jesus followers for everything that we do to be a form of worship to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? And so today I want to show you from a lot of different places in Scripture, we'll primarily focus on Ephesians 6 today. So if you have a Bible and you want to turn there, go ahead and turn to Ephesians 6. I want to give you some context of what the Apostle Paul is saying in Ephesians 6. So Ephesians 6 verses 5 through 9 and then also in Colossians 3 are eerily similar passages. And it's often referred to as the household code or the household rules. And the reason why is he uses this term that we are, when we first read it, depending on your translation, you may go, whoa, that's a bad term. One translation probably better reads as bond servants, and a bond servant was someone who essentially served in the home. And so the reason why in a lot of passages when Paul says, husbands, you do this, wives, you do this, you know, children, you do this, and then bond servants, you do this, is because they were all working in the context of the home. They were still working and interacting with each other, but a lot of bond servants worked in the the home. Now, no matter what stage of life you're in, I hope that this will apply to all of us. So by show of hands, this is going to be loud and proud. How many of you are still in the workforce as an employee? Okay. That means you have a boss that you report to. Okay. How many of you are a, a boss yourself? Like you have people that you oversee. Okay. All the moms, raise your hand. Amen. Right. We know that moms are the bosses of the world. Okay. That's actually quite literally true. Um, and so now, for the rest of us, how many of you volunteer from some sort of an organization? Nonprofit, you know, the church, go to a Bible study? Okay, so that about covers all of us. So before you check out and say, I I'm not working, I'm not working outside of the home, these principles will apply to all of us in our work relationships because God wants to use us to be a light to the world. I've said this before, but I'll say it again. You and I are God's plan A for evangelism of the world. There's no plan B. That God wants to use you right where you are to reach the people around you. Now, before we look at Ephesians 6, I want to give you the main thought for today. If you've got a listener guide, wave it in the air like you just do care. All right, here we go. The main thought for today is this. Our work, meaning what we do, does not define us. How many of you are thankful for that today? That Jesus, because of his work on the cross, it doesn't matter what we do, it doesn't matter what we have done, that his finished work on the cross is what defines us. But how we work and interact with others is a big test of our character as Christians. That if we want the world to see Jesus, they will oftentimes look at my life and your life before they will ever look at a Bible. So we have to live that out every single day. Now, I want to talk to four different categories today, and we're going to bounce around a little bit in Scripture because there's a lot of different places in Scripture that I think support what we're talking about. The reason why I use a lot of Scripture is because I don't want you to think that I'm coming up with my ideas. If I'm coming up with my ideas, we are up a creek without a paddle, okay? You can say amen to that, okay? All right. The first thing is to employees and volunteers— and the first thing that we have to do as employees or volunteers is to follow and trust your leadership. Follow and trust your leadership. Say trust. Ephesians 6, Paul says this. Now this first word, when we read this, we think, oh no, 18th, 19th century America. Horrific time in our country. Absolutely inexcusable. I want to talk a little bit about the differences because in the first century, that's more known as a bond servant. So that would have been someone who voluntarily signed up to work in a home or a place. Uh, they were taken care of. They were paid wages. And so that's why he includes this in the list of household duties, if you will, when he writes to the church in Colossae and the church in Ephesus. So he says, slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. He goes on to say, obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. And then he says, serve wholeheartedly. Y'all say wholeheartedly. That means not halfway. He says, 
as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one of you whatever, for whatever they do, whether they are slave or free. The writer of Hebrews also says it this way, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority. So in both places, we are told if we are an employee, if we are a volunteer, that we should trust the people that God has placed over us in authority. Now, here's the caveat. We should trust them up until that place that they either give us a really good reason not to trust them or they ask us to do something that is unbiblical. Now, I don't know what your boss, your leader, your supervisor is like. I pray that he's not or she's not asking you to do things that are unbiblical. But we have to, as Christians, understand the difference between when something goes against our preferences and when something goes against the Bible. You get it? There, there's a huge difference in those places because how many of you know a lot of times in life, if you have a boss and you have a J-O-B or you are S-E-R-V-E-ing, there's a lot of things that are involved with that that we don't necessarily want to do. There's a lot of things in my life. I love what I do. I am so called to what I do. But there's a lot of things that I do on a consistent basis that I don't want to do. So there's, here's the principle. There's a huge difference in something being unbiblical and something being unpreferential. And we have to prayerfully discern those two differences. A lot of times, there may be a very good reason why your boss, your teacher, your coach, students, whatever it may be, the leader in your life, there may be a very good reason why they've asked you to do what they've asked you to do. And you may not always, and I may not always understand it. I want to give you an example here. I've asked Scott Dickerson in advance if I could pick on him. He doesn't have to stand up. Where is Scott? There he is, right over there. Scott is an amazing guy, leader in our church. He's on our deacon leadership team. Um, Scott, you can pay me later for bragging on you. I'm just kidding. Um, so Scott is, is a turf salesman by day. And so let's pretend for a minute. I'm a kid's pastor at heart, so we're going to play pretend for just a moment. Uh, let's pretend I work for Scott. And I go to Scott with this brilliant idea that we need to start selling pink AstroTurf. Okay? I mean, I know that's a really good idea, right? How many of you agree that it's a good idea? Okay, we got one person. Thank you, Mark. So everybody else, I hope in their right mind, thinks that it's a terrible idea. And so I go to Scott as my boss. Let's pretend he's my boss. And I say, Scott, listen, we've been missing it this whole time, man. We need to sell pink AstroTurf. And he goes, well, thanks, Russell, for your feedback. However, studies show that most people in their right mind are probably going to buy some shade of green AstroTurf. Why? Because it looks like your grass, right? I don't know if you have pink lawns. If you do, share the secrets with us, okay? Now, that would be a crazy idea on my part. I realize that's an extreme example, but Scott, in that case, would have a really good reason why they are selling green AstroTurf. It's not my preference. My preference would be pink AstroTurf. I'm making this up, as you know. But that's a real example of how many times in my life and your life that in our workplaces and the places we volunteer, things may not always be according to our preferences. We as Jesus followers have to be willing to step into that space and say, you know what? God's called me to serve under this leader up until they ask me to do something that isn't biblical. And that's where we have to trust our leadership that God has put in place in our life. Walt Disney said it this way, leadership means that a group, large or small, is willing to entrust authority to a person who has shown judgment, wisdom, personal appeal, and proven competence. competence. So in your life, what are the leaders like? And if, if I would say at the end of the day, if it's coming down to you don't trust them, now I'm not here to give you life or work advice, but if there is a consistent pattern of you in disagreement with your leadership, then you may have some bigger questions to ask about you're serving in that organization or you're working for that organization. I'm not telling you to go quit your job. I don't want my email flooded. This is all your fault, okay? But you may need to ask yourself some hard questions about that organization if you are constantly in disagreement with them. So that's the first thing. Second thing for us as employees or volunteers, this directly relates to the first point, is we've got to pray for patience and discernment. 
Pray for patience and discernment. Philippians 1.9, Paul tells us this. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, a.k.a. in in discernment. And then he goes on to say, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. So what he's saying is one of the best ways we can support our leadership is that we have to pray for that discernment to know that line in the sand of unpreferential and unbiblical, unpreferential and unbiblical. And that takes an incredible amount of wisdom and discernment. Now, this may be hard to do. It may be hard to be patient with your boss because your boss is, guess what, human. And how many of you know that humans are broken and fallen, even the best humans? And some of us may have a boss that looks a little bit like the boss in Office Space. Anybody ever seen the movie Office Space? Those are the, I'm just, I've never seen it because I don't watch secular movies at all. I'm a pastor. But I want to show you this clip from Office Space. You apparently didn't put one of the new cover sheets on your TPS reports. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry about that. I, I forgot. Mm, yeah. You see, we're putting the cover sheets on all TPS reports now before they go out. Did you see the memo about this? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I have the memo right here. I just uh, forgot. But uh, it's not shipping out till tomorrow, so there's no problem. Yeah. If you could just go ahead and make sure you do that from now on, that would be great. And uh, I'll go ahead and make sure you get another copy of that memo. Okay? Yeah, no, I, I, right, I have the memo. I've got it. It's right. Hello, Phil. What's happening? Uh... Now, if your boss is like that, it's probably hard to have patience sometimes, right? I don't know if you heard the first part, but he was essentially being overbearing, micromanaging. And some leaders are, are like that. And so we as Christians have to... Pray for the patience and discernment to serve in those situations. But here's the principle we can learn from that. Patience and discernment will help us work with difficult bosses in a Christ-like manner. You can show Jesus to your boss with how you serve around their leadership. The next thing, we have to talk directly and respectfully about issues. Talk directly and respectfully about issues. Now, in Matthew 18... We see a clear passage of issues in the church, but I also think that this can apply to issues in the workplace. It says this in Matthew 18, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over, but if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. In Proverbs, we're also told of how we should have conversations with people. It says this, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. So if we are a Jesus follower and we are in disagreement with a coach, a teacher, a leader, some person in leadership in our life, it doesn't mean we have to bottle it up and just deal with it. We can respectfully go to that person and have a conversation with them about what it is we disagree with. So you go to that person in private, you have that conversation respectfully, Here's what we have to know, though. A lot of times I think that we go into that conversation expecting them to go, you know what, Bobby, you're right. I was so wrong. What was I thinking? Scott telling me, you know what, we've been missing it. Pink AstroTurf, that has been the, the mystery to our business. That's why we're not selling enough AstroTurf. A lot of times we expect that conversation to go like that, don't we? Yet, what we have to know is that our, our job is not to always change their minds. Our job is to speak what God has placed on our heart and entrust that he will work on their hearts in his due timing. And so half the battle, though, of being a good employee or volunteer in an organization is believing in the why of what you're doing more than agreeing with the what. You see the difference? Like, so if you believe in the mission of what you're doing, if you're serving in a nonprofit if you're working at a company and you believe in the mission, you may not always agree with every single decision that's made, but you're so sold on what you're doing for your job that you're willing to get along with some of these things that you don't always agree with. I remember at my previous church, uh, the senior pastor came up with an idea, and he said we were going to do this thing. He, he will turn 87 this summer, still in ministry, still preaching every week, a lot of weeks, and uh, 
he said, hey, we're going to do this idea, and all of us as staff members were like, what? We're going to do what? Like, this is the craziest thing we had ever heard in our life. And so we tried to say, um, Pastor, uh, can we offer a suggestion? Like, I'm suggesting we probably not do this. It wasn't anything bad or immoral. It just was kind of wacky and out there. And so he, he just was emphatic that, hey, gang, we're going to do this. this. This is what we're going for. And honestly, we, every single one of us as staff members thought it was going to be the worst idea. It was going to be a miserable fail. And we were all going to eventually say, I told you so, except not really say that, right? So the day happens. We do this idea. We were all wrong. It was the most, like, everyone was talking about it for months afterwards. It was a home run. And all of us were like, well, we were wrong. That's why, uh, you know what, at the end of the day, that was his idea. So I use that in your organization that your boss may have an idea that you're like, man, I would not do it that way. But at the end of the day, God has placed him or her in that position of leadership in your life for a reason. And we have to trust that God has placed them there for that reason. All right, second group. The next group I want to talk to is co-workers and co-volunteers. Again, show of hands, volunteering in an organization. One more time, working. Okay, so this is more of how do we interact with each other, okay? That first part is how we interact with the people we report to. This is how we interact with each other. So collaboration and celebration is always greater than competition. Collaboration and celebration is always greater than competition. What does that mean? Working with the people I work around and being willing to celebrate their successes will always be better for us as Jesus followers than tr seeing them as our competition, right? Especially as a Jesus follower. So many times in my life and in your life, we see our coworkers or our volunteers, our teammates, if we're students, our choir mates, we see them as our biggest competition. And when they get the promotion or they get the raise or they, get the, they make the game-winning shot, what's our natural instinct, if we're honest? To be mad, right? To, to not want to cheer from. I can't tell you how many times I had teammates that were outfielders, which I played, and they hit a home run. I'm like, good job. <clears throat> right? It's, it's a begrudging thing. But one of the best ways we can show Jesus to people around us is to, as Romans 12, 15 says, rejoice with those who rejoice. Do we celebrate the people around us? Matthew 7, 12 tells us why we should do this. So in everything... Do unto others what you would have them do to you. If you get the promotion, don't you want other people to celebrate that? You make the team, you make the shot. There's nothing worse if you're in a team context. You make the game-winning shot and you come to a bench and nobody's high-fiving you, right? If you've ever seen that before where they prank people and they just sit there and intentionally ignore them. That's what it may feel like when we have people around us that are not cheering with us. And so as Jesus followers, we have to be willing to be a difference maker in that situation. Why? Here's why. Our co-workers are not our competition field. They're not our competition field. They are our mission field. The people around us may not know Jesus, and because of that, we have to celebrate their successes. The next thing, promote loyalty to your leadership. I would remind all of us as we talk to each other, there is a difference in talking to each other about a certain situation as wise counsel and letting it turn into gossip, right? That we, you may, the, the water cooler is the very tempting conversation. Hey, can you believe such and such is happening? Can you believe this is going on? We're all guilty of it, right? If we're not careful, we can let those conversations become gossip. Romans 13, verse 2 says this, Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves and will be punished. So it's pretty clear, right, that we are called, even if we don't always agree with them, we should not be going behind their backs and spreading gossip. Psalm 101, verse 5, whoever slanders their neighbor in secret, I will put to silence. So if you have a listener guide, here's the principle. I would encourage you to write this down. You can disagree with some decisions in your organization, but yet still agree with the mission and vision of your organization. Could be your team, could be your volunteering place. I don't know what that looks like for you, but when you have issues, here's what you've got to do. If you have issues with people around you, we talked to them first, 
and then you go to leadership, right? So if you have an issue, if you're a student and you've got an issue with another student, we go to the student first in private or the other person in private. So we talk horizontal and then vertical. How many of you have had kids before that are a tattletale, right? I've got a four-year-old that like when Drew does one thing wrong, Drew is a sweet kid and he is generally a rule follower, but like the one time he does something wrong, David comes in running. Daddy, did you hear? see what Drew did? I'm like, don't be a tattletale. And some of us are like that in our organization. We jump, we have an issue with somebody around us and we jump straight ahead to the boss, to mom and dad of the organization and rat them out as opposed to just going and having that conversation in private, right? Why is that important? Because at the end of the day, God wants us to interact with people around us, to be salt and light with the people around us. So what, is, what do we have to do? Talk to people, not about people. Talk to people, not about people. And Matthew 18 is a clear example of that. All right, third category. If you're tracking, say, I'm tracking. One more time. If you're tracking, say, I'm tracking. All right. You just shake it out a little bit. To bosses and leaders. How many of you are a boss or a leader or a committee chair or a Bible study leader or something of that nature? Okay. So you have people that serve underneath you. This is incredibly important because as the leader goes, so the organization goes. Amen? So it says this in James 1, 5. If any of you lacks wisdom... You should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. What's the first thing, leaders, we have to do? Pray for wisdom. Pray for wisdom. Why? Because we don't know it all. We don't have all the answers. Even great leaders don't have all the answers. Now, here's why that's hard. A lot of people that reach leadership status, why do they reach leadership status? talented, right? They're maybe good at what they do. They're smart. They, they are, excel at things. And if we're not careful, if you're leading an organization, you can start to rely on your own talent more than we rely on the Lord. And so great leaders, here's what they do. Great leaders need to lead from their knees. Great leaders realize they don't know it all, but they know the one who does know it all. So if you're leading in any capacity, It could be an exercise class. It could be whatever it may be. You need to, and I need to be leading from our knees. The next thing, seek to serve. Seek to serve. Jesus modeled this, Matthew 20, 26. But among you, it will be, what does that say? Different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must boss everyone around. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must do things their own way all the time. No, it says must be your servant must be your servant many people want to be the boss because they think what i get to boss everybody around it's a natural inclination that's why moms you know we we trust your leadership because you're good at telling us where where to go and what to do but great leaders have a give to mentality not a get from mentality great leaders realize hey how can i raise you up how can i equip you to do what you're called to do how can i support you how can i bring your talents out in this specific situation. Mike Krzyzewski, who's a famous basketball coach. How many of you have heard of Mike Krzyzewski, the Duke basketball coach? He said it this way, leadership is simple, add value to people every day. What if we did that as Jesus followers, where we strive to add value to their life? John Maxwell said it this way, to add value to others, one must first value others. People who add value to others do so intentionally. I say that because to add value to others, leaders must give of themselves, and watch this, it says, and that rarely occurs by accident. We have to be intentional if we want to add value to people around us. Seek to listen. Seek to listen. A lot of us, I'm guilty of this. We want to what? Talk first, listen next. Proverbs 18, 13 says this, to answer before listening, that is a wise choice. No, it says that is folly and shame. Great leaders lead with their ears before leading with their mouth. You may not always agree with what that person has to say. It's okay. It's okay to agree to disagree with someone around you, but we can still listen to that person around us. Amen? Listening does not necessarily mean agreement with the opinions of a person, 
but it does mean agreement with the value of a person. So when you allow someone to come into your life and say, hey, I need to talk to you about whatever it is, and you, you listen to them, you give them the time, the attention, you are saying, I value you as a person. You may not agree with every decision or every thought that they have, but you're valuing them as a person. Finally, I would say to stand firm in vision and conviction. So if you are leading a Bible study, whatever it may be, if you are leading in any capacity and God has given you a clear vision for how to lead that area, I would encourage you to stand firm in that vision and conviction. Philippians 1, 27, Paul says this, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then it says, then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, striving together as for one faith of the gospel. What is he saying? He's saying when you're in leadership and you live with integrity, you can stand firm and be confident that it's okay for every single person around you to not agree with every decision you make. God may be calling you to effectuate change in your organization. You may be having to swim upstream where you're leading, and that may be difficult. That's part of it. But I would encourage you to stand firm if that's what God has called you to do. I want to give you an example of that. How many of you have heard of a guy named Martin Luther? If you know anything about Martin Luther, he's kind of the guy who came up with this thing called the Protestant Reformation. Kind of a big deal, wasn't it? He nailed 95 pieces of paper to a door. And two of his big principles that he believed were, number one, that a Christian is saved by grace through faith alone and that works do not earn our salvation. The second thing he believed was that the average common person should have access to the scriptures. So previous to this time, the only person in that context that would have a physical Bible themselves was the equivalent of whoever was here on Sunday mornings. Look under your chairs. What do you see? A Bible. Can you imagine a world that we lived in without that? Now, he faced incredible persecution, incredible controversy, yet he stood with conviction because he knew that's what God was calling him to do. Imagine if he had said, you know what, you're right. Let's just stay with the same way. As leaders, we are called to stand with conviction. Another Martin Luther, Martin Luther King Jr. Imagine if he had stepped back and not stepped forward. He said it this way, I have a dream that my four children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Thank God for Martin Luther King Jr., amen? That he effectuated change in our country, and he faced so much persecution, but he knew God had given him a vision. Let me encourage you, if you're in leadership today, stand firm in that vision and conviction. Listen to the people around you, but stand firm when God calls you to stand firm. Finally, lead with integrity. Proverbs 4.23, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Here's what people with integrity can do. They live with humility and honesty. A leader who is willing to say, my bad, I messed up. Isn't that a profound thing? How many of you have ever worked for a boss that just refused to apologize? Anybody ever been there? How much did you love working for that boss or not love? How long did you stay working for that boss? Yet on the flip side, when a leader comes to you and says, I messed up there. It's on me. Will you forgive me for that? It's a powerful thing, isn't it? And as leaders, we have to model that example. Finally, this goes to everybody. I would conclude with this. Seek harmony and God's glory. Seek to live in harmony and seek God's glory. Why? Paul tells us in Romans 15. May God who gives this patience and encouragement help you live in complete harmony with each other as is fitting for followers of Christ Jesus. Then all of you can join together with one voice, giving praise and glory to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So as we work and as we serve with other people, if we are making Jesus and harmony God's or our priority, then God will use us to be a light to people around us. And here's what will happen when we live in contentment, when we cheer for others, when we do all of these things. I know it's a lot. That's probably two messages worth, but 
I think it's important for us to live out because when we go out those doors each and every week, we're heading out on mission. And God wants the world to look at me and look at you and see a difference in our lives. Amen? I'll close with this. Some time ago, scientists were studying the human body, and they were kind of starting to discover the basic elements of the human body, and they started to discover different proteins in the body, and they finally started to discover this common denominator in the human body. It seemed to be the the protein that kind of linked all the cells together. It's this protein called laminin. It's pretty fascinating. It's actually kind of, they, they call it, scientists call it the glue. They call it the rebar, if you will, of the human body. If you've ever seen a picture of laminin, or if you have not seen a picture, I want you to see what laminin looks like. Look like something else you know? Colossians 1.17 says this. He is before all things, and in him all things are held together. If we want to live in harmony with others around us, if we want to be salt and light in the organizations that we serve and as we work, we've got to keep the cross the first and foremost thing. So when we seek to make much of Jesus, when we keep him our focus, when he is the forefront what happens is when Jesus is our focus, living in harmony should usually follow along. Let us be a people that seek to keep Jesus at the first and foremost, knowing that when we do that, God will use us to make much of him. Amen?